we're going to approach her in two different ways. Approach her by a story, which I will tell a story as if I am her, and then some talk about how I think she's appropriate for our, and what she has to offer our age. I am Hildegard. I know the cost of keeping silent, and I know the cost of speaking out. Hear my story. Perhaps you know me as Hildegard of Bingham, but it was several miles from Bingham where I was born, in the Nahe Valley in Germany, in the year of our Lord, 1098. Do you know the Rhineland, any of you? Do you know it? Some of you do. I think you will agree it is the most beautiful place. Rich and green, moist and fruitful. The rolling hills stretch as far as the eyes can see, crowned here and there with rocky crags and tall watchtowers. And in the valleys, the neat fields and the tidy villages give ample sustenance for humankind and their beasts. And through it all, Rose throws the mighty river Rhine, bringing growth and fruitfulness to the earth and a means of movement and transport to all who live there. They call it now, I believe, the fatherland. Very odd. <laughs> for the earth is our mother. She is the mother of all, for she contains in herself the seeds of all. The earth contains all verdancy, all moisture, all germinating power. All creation comes from it. Yet it contains not only the raw material of humankind, but the substance of the incarnation of God's own son. Being the tenth child, I was tithed to God and sent at the age of eight to live at the Abbey of St. Disibold with an anchoress called Jutta. From Jutta, I learned so much of everyday things, of spinning and weaving and cooking, but also of the ever-present, all-embracing love of God and of the Holy Spirit, which throws like sap through our veins, bringing growth and fruitfulness. From my earliest childhood, God revealed God's self to me in many ways, sometimes in words, sometimes in images, sometimes in music, sometimes in all three. And I knew of that love in all things. But I also saw the gr sloth and corruption of the priests, the violation of the natural world, and I knew anger as well as joy. I looked and I listened, I saw and I heard, yet ever within me grew the desire to speak out I consulted my spiritual directors, people I was required to respect and indeed to obey. They told me it was not my place to speak out. My role was to tend the needs of my community and pray ever faithfully, but silently. How could I then have recognised within myself the burning power of the prophets when the word of God burns in the heart? and aches in the bones. For it was not out of stubbornness that I refused to speak, but out of a supposed humility. And I found myself pressed down by God into a bed of sickness. But lo, in the 43rd year of my life's course, I was taken up in a vision, and there I regarded a great radiance. And the radiance spoke to me. Ash of ash, corruption of corruption. Tell and write what you see and what you hear. And behold, I stood up and I set my hand to writing. The words poured out of me in a torrent, a great outpouring of God's word, God's spirit. 
and I no longer felt beaten down, I started to write my first book. It was to take me 10 years to write. I called it Skivias, Knowing the Ways. And contrary to my previous fears and humidity, I was heard. People came to me from far and near, and I wrote many letters to the leaders of the day, like the Emperor Barbarossa and Bernard of Clairvaux. The Holy Father heard of me. He sent a commission to investigate me. <laughs> he found me competent and authentic, and he wrote, encouraging my writing. By this time, Jutta had died, and our community was growing, but we were still squashed into Jutta's tiny house. The monks of St. Disibode had expanded too, taking up all the available land for their buildings and their animals. Abbot Cuno was implacable. Can you imagine the arguments, the counter-arguments, and the endless frustration of not being heard? Eventually, we just packed up our things and left, not waiting for the men's permission and taking our dowries with us. We started to build on the banks of the Rhine at Bingen, on a hill which I dedicated to my dear St. Rupert. I myself supervised the building, making sure that all was spacious and comfortable. We even had piped water. <laughs> Perhaps I remembered the journeys, the frozen journeys to the well and breaking the ice on the washing trough. But more, I think, our creator God does not delight in our bodily discomfort, especially when it is self-inflicted. It has been said that the body is at war with the soul. But how can this be? He made us as whole beings, and our souls can only find expression through the actions of our bodies. Indeed, I am persuaded that when body and soul act together in mutual agreement, they receive the highest reward of mutual joy. On the Rupertsburg, I and my sisters found new ways to worship God sometimes wearing coloured robes and golden crowns as befits the Brides of Christ, not always with ecclesiastical permission. <laughs> I myself continued to have the visions and continued my writing. I wrote on theology, the lives of the saints, and healing and medicine. And I, a woman, travelled the length and the depth of Germany, and I preached from the pulpits of the great abbeys. And ever I spoke of God's justice, and I exhorted the leaders of state and church to excise corruption and work for the beauty and the relationship of all creation. And in it, and through it, and round it, is always the music. For music expresses most clearly the unity of creation as God first created it and expresses the human love for the creator. But in the last year of my life, the music was silenced. You see, we'd buried in the grounds of our convent a man who'd been excommunicated before he died. But he'd confessed before he died, and his body was entitled to rest in hallowed ground. I, although I was old and ill, went out and removed all traces of the grave so that it could not be violated. For I fear the justice of God more than the justice of men. We were excommunicated and stopped from singing the office. 
It was a time of great grief and heavy sadness. In spite of a vision, in a vision, I wrote to the Archbishop and I reminded him that those who silence the music of God on earth will have no part of the song of the angels in heaven. And the music goes on. O viridissima virga, ave que inventoso, flabros giscitationis sanctorum radisti, cum veni tempus quod tu floruisti in ramis tuis. Ave, ave sitibi, qui a calo solis in te su David, sicut odo balsami. Nam in te floruit pulca flows, qui odorem dedit omnibus aromatibus, Quea rida erant, et illa paru erant omnia in viriditate plena. Unde se lidet erant rorem supergramen, et omnis terra leta facta est, Quoniam viscera ipsius fumentum proctularum, et quoniam volucre celi nidos in ipsa habuerunt. De inde facta est esca hominibus, et gaudium magnum et pulantium unde O suavis virgo, in te non deficit ulum gaudium. Heg omnia eva contempsit, nunc autem lausit, Altissimo. But the words and the songs that I uttered came from no human source. God moves where he wills and not at the request of any human creature. And I am ever in fear and trembling and I ever doubt my own capacities. But I lift my hands to God that I may be carried like a feather without power or strength of its own, is carried on the breath of the wind. I died in the year 1179, but I do not think that death has silenced me. Some of you today may hear my voice. I was 81 years old when I died, so I had kept silent for half my life, and I had spoken out for half my life. Perhaps that is the right balance. Taking in, receiving, and giving out in and out, like breathing, like the breath of God. <laughs> so there we are. When I first put this together, Margaret Thatcher was in power 
I often wonder what a meeting between those two might have looked like. It's marvellous to imagine, isn't it, really? <laughs> so how, does she, how is she important for us? Well, she comes, of course, from a very different culture, uh, from the culture of the Middle Ages. And in some ways, she's not remarkable. She's part of that culture. And lots of people say to me, having heard me speak, she was, you know, she was ahead of her age. Actually, in many ways, she was part of her age. Uh, and there are bits that we've lost somewhere along the line in what I often call the so-called enlightenment. Um, so here she is, on, if you're looking at this other sheet here, which has the figures on it. Um, the first figure, figure number one, is Hildegard in the context of her convent. Um, you see her there in the middle with a tablet on which she's writing. Uh, to the left, you see her faithful monk called Volmar. And Volmar was charged with writing down the visions. Um, she was aware that her Latin wasn't as good as the men's Latin would be, because she would have picked up her Latin from hearing the mass in Latin, rather than the formal um, education that the men would have had. So Volmar's job was to turn it into decent Latin, but he was told off if he added his own thoughts. So um, we don't quite know what the black thing is she's got in her hand, whether she was scratching something, sketching the visions and so on and so forth. Um, but the visions were given as part of that and the visions that you see there um, and you want to look at later on, they, are, um, they were painted by the nuns in the scriptorium after the visions. So we have the account which Volmar would have taken down and then we have um, the, the, the visions themselves. I think today she would have made a video <coughs> of it um, because these appear to have images, um, singing, uh, music and speech and so on. Uh, <coughs> so that's uh, where she is. On the right, we see a woman um, there who might be perhaps the most famous one, Richardus of Stada, who she was obviously very fond of and may have been the woman that she wrote some of her more elaborate um, music for. Um, once they moved to Bingen, you probably realize that the monasteries and the, the abbeys and the convents at that time interfaced with the aristocracy and indeed um, the, the, the monarchies in, in various ways. And Richardus of Stada was given her own convent um, in the north of, uh, and she left much to Hildegard's. We have the letter to her, which actually shows a, a, another side of Hildegard, which you know, how could you leave me? I am your mother and I loved you so much and all of that. Unfortunately, Richardus died relatively soon after getting her own convent. Um, and that relationship is often debated between Richardus. And my friend uh, Brian Ingalls has written a whole opera about that and so on. So there she is in her convent. And unlike many, many mystics in the middle, she always portrays herself and I think at the end over there, you see her. She's always portrayed in a conventual situation. She's never portrayed on her own. So she's always in context. Um, and you see the medieval sort of trope, the, 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 the fire coming down into the head, which is a traditional trope for the arrival of the spirit and so on. So you heard in the, um, in the description uh, that she saw that this is figure two, that, and this is part of the, uh, and of these armies were singing with marvelous voices, all kinds of music, these are the, the angels, um, about the wonders that God works in blessed souls. And by this, God is magnificently glor um, glorified. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, God wonderfully formed and ordered creation. So she talks a lot about justice and justice is right relationship between human beings and the natural world and the divine and so on. So just a few points of what she has to offer our particular age. The word viriditas, which you heard in the hymn, the hymn to the Virgin, the greening branch, appears to be her word. There are a few accounts of it, in um, usage of it in, a, in North African manuscripts, but she appears to have created viriditas, which is often translated as greening power. And she saw greening power running through everything. It runs through us, but it's the same thing that runs through us as runs through the trees and the grass and the earth. So there's a greening power into which we all tap and so on. 
And that is very much, and that's going on all the time. This greening is going on. Those of you who do know the Rhine, and if you go to the abbey, uh, these current abbeys in Tildegard, it is, you've got this low-hanging mist all the time, which does make it very green and so on, because it's very damp. It's rather like Ireland in that sort of damp atmosphere, which makes that very bright emerald green um, and so on. And green was very important. The emerald was a very important crystal in her thinking because it's, it's very green and so on. And that notion of a continual greening, which means that creation is not a one-off, creation is continually going on. So this viriditas is an, a constant incarnation and a bringing of life. This links very much with the process um, the theologians and the process philosophers, people like Whitehead, the process um, um, philosopher, who then feeds into Catherine Keller on process theology. Uh, that, uh, and, and indeed, from that comes the notion that God is a verb and not a noun. So I wrote a song in one of my books that's, we'll all go a-godding. So, <laughs> and that's what we're doing. We're going a-godding, and it's easier to see um, God as a, as a process going on uh, because of all the problem of, we've had with defining God and the way we've often made God a bit small by defining God and so on. So that notion of viriditas and fertility and creativity is important. It, it's a line comes through that into the notion of, of a processing and so on. As I said at the beginning, music plays an extraordinarily important part in that. So singing connects us to the divine. And of course, we would say that that has come, become particularly true now with the growth of community choirs for a variety of, of, of purposes. So in our own church in Tooting, we have the heart and lung choir from St. George's Hospital singing regularly there. Um, prescribed by the, uh, the doctors at the hospital. Uh, the Croydon Carers Choir, a choir where people who are caring for people regularly come and sing together and find that there are other people who are experiencing the dilemmas of caring and, and so on. So there has been a huge, particularly um, people singing into the internet and all of that during COVID. There's been a rediscovering of, of singing as an incredibly important part of healing. Her theology of music is best expressed. She writes what some people would call the first opera. It's a morality play with music, and really most of her theology is in that. that the, it's the journey of the soul who is helped by um, the virtues and not helped by the devil. Now, the devil only speaks because the devil's not connected. <laughs> so that notion that that if you, if you only speak, you're not connected, is revealed in that. The devil, in the end, manages to, to say, come with me and I will give you everything. And so she throws off the road of, robe of faith and the virtues get their act together and, uh, and get the robe of faith back on and eventually chain the devil in front. We think it might even be Paul Volmar who might have come from, <laughs> from uh, uh, Dissi Bodenberg to Bingen who might have well have been playing the devil and so on. And uh, the, the play is very interesting because it's got little parts for the virtues. So love comes on and says, this is what I do. And victory comes on and says, this is what I do. Charity comes, uh, ca um, uh, uh, all the others come on. For a, a group of inexperienced nuns, it's ideal, really, because everybody has a little line and then they drop back into the chorus. It's un undoubtedly Hildegard probably played the role of the soul herself, possibly, and so on. So this theology of music um, is very important to her, which is why excommunication for her was actually probably be better than being banned from singing in that final bit. Um, anyway, so there we are. The music was written, and this is figure three, um, as a series of neumes, which is the way plain song was written at that time. And you'll see them if you want to see them more clearly further down there. Um, uh, so she would not have written them down. It's extremely unlikely that she would have been literate musically. She would have been given them directly in the visions. In fact, doing any critique of Hildegard's music feels like critique, critiquing the divine because these were direct from the divine. They weren't hers. They were direct from her. And you saw that trope in, in that 
I mean, I don't like saying that God says to me, I'm dust of dust and corruption of corruption, but God often did say that to women mystics. It's an interesting trope, really, because if that's what you are, then what, what you get is necessarily divine. So you see how it's a good trope. It's not me. I'm dust of dust and corruption of corruption, so what I have is necessarily from God. And we find that in Julian of Norwich and other, other mystics and so on. And here we have an interesting thing, that, that in fact what we have is an orate tradition. She's receiving it orally and remembering it. We don't know how it was remembered, how it was written down. But there are many women uh, singers in the Middle Ages whose music we don't have, because to write it down required money. It required money to buy the vellum, it required money to employ the person who understood the neumes to write it down. So it was expensive, but it looks as though she was valued enough to have it written down. There are two manuscripts of it. Um, one is um, in, in Germany, the other one is in Dendermonde in Belgium. So that notion of the orate, and while that was a tradition, and the notated tradition was only developing in Paris just after she died, um, women had a chance. But after that, with the lack of women's education, they sort of got lost because they weren't able to learn the notated systems. So, and we, we see sometimes, I liken her to the singer-songwriters like jo um, Joan Byers, Johnny Mitchell, all of that, where you've got a capacity just to sing over your guitar and, and so on, and all of that. So that relationship between the orate and the literate um, is interesting. There are different little patterns which she uses over and over again, just like a jazz musician would you use jazz being in origin an orate tradition. How far her nuns join in, they, the, the music doesn't fit terribly easily with the, with the psalm chants. How far they sang it, they sang it together. Some of them are called hymns. The one I sang is called a hymn. It's relatively simple. There are not lots of long um, uh, sort of melismas. But we don't, we simply don't know. I'm using a, a drone here. We don't know whether there was a drone. There's a possibility that on one of the early organs, it was possible the organs would have been played with fists at that point to hold a note down of some kind or other. Um, and some of you will have heard a drone in some recordings. And we simply, we don't know. We don't know what pitch they were sung or anything like that. So if we turn to figure four, there we see something of the medieval period. The medieval period, um, actually, basically, was governed medically by the doctrine of humours. That was originating with Hippocrates in the ancient Greece and then made popular in Europe by Galen. And there we see in that particular model how <clears throat> the world is governed by hot, dry, wet, and cold, and we are governed by hot, dry, wet, and cold. So each of us will have one of those which is dominant, which links, of course, with some of the Ayurvedic traditions. So we may be, I may be a hot person, or, um, and if I'm a hot person, it's a cold day, I'll be very unhappy. But if I'm a cold person, it's a cold day, I'll be very happy because I'm in the right element. So how we respond is a relationship between us and the environment, um, and so on. And that was linked, as you can see there, with various bits of the body, which is why it got discredited it was linked with um, yellow bile and um, blood and black bile and phlegm. And it was really the black bile bit that got it discredited because nobody quite knows that was. But you can see that that's related to earth, air, fire and water. So this system, in my it was is much more subtle than our current allopathic medicine system because if people come to you and they're ill, the first thing you have to work out is whether they're earthy, fiery, watery or, or, or dry, then you have to look at what the weather is, and then you can prescribe. <laughs> but you, the um, sort of prescribing fennel on a hot day for a cold person is very different from prescribing it on a hot day for a hot person. So there's a subtlety about it, and one that is in profound relationship with the natural world, which we've almost lost completely. Um, uh, coming back, of course, in alternative medicines, but not, um, not in the allopathic tradition. Um, Isaac took up the four humours in his analysis of personality types, so it reappeared there. 
but it is a deeply embodied tradition. So a person's blood and humours are affected by the time of the moon's movement. Specifically, the air moves to good or bad weather following the moon, and corresponding to them, the blood, the humours flow within a person, and the water conservation affects human behaviour. So there's a, there you see that the body and the environment are inextricably bound together. And we see over and over again in her writing, like the curvature of a revolving wheel, the top of the human head is the brain, against which there leans a ladder with various stages of ascent, the eyes for seeing, the ears for hearing, the nose for smelling, the mouth for speaking. For God has formed us and enlightened us with the living breath of the soul. The divinity has provided us with flesh and blood, filled us out and strengthened us with bones, just as earth is strengthened with rock. So she brings the body back in. Jutta, it would seem, was an ascetic, the woman to whom she was um, ablated at eight, and would have done, as was the, some of the characteristic of ascetic Middle Ages, wearing chains and things next to her body. And she died in her 40s. And it's, it's perhaps Hildegard being close to that ascetic that led her to develop the notion that God didn't ask us, as I said in there, um, he made us as whole beings and, you know, our soul can only find expression through the actions of our bodies. So it's very anti the persecution of the body for the sake of the soul. So very much um, the, uh, an embodied truth, really. Um, um, right here. And, when, um, and when she writes of the infusion of the soul and the fetus, she's the first woman really to write of pregnancy and childbirth. And, and it, she's extremely detailed. She sees the fetus unfolding and the, uh, the, the fingers appearing and all of that. And she describes the process of pregnancy as the soul gradually infusing the fetus. And so when the soul is completely infused, then the baby will be born. But she describes, it's difficult to tell whether she's writing poetry or whether she's writing um, a, a scientific treatise. And she talks about the soul infusing the body like a caterpillar spinning silk. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely beautiful. She has lots of remedies. Wine should not be drunk unquenched. Should always be mixed with water. So you should be always drinking your water with wine. And also we have this tremendous earthiness of her. The earthworm is very hot. It grows in the same veridity in which grasses begin to sprout. It grows in that noisy greenness, and because of its clean nature, it has no bones. It is good and useful. The other useful things, such as cinnamon. Earth has moisture in it, which is contained in something like veins, so it does not flow out. Well, that's exactly what Georges Monbiot has just written. Um, when the rain is about to fall from the air, this moisture feeds the coming rain, which will fill its veins. The earthworms understand this replenishing of the earth's veins and come forth. Well, there's a careful piece of scientific writing, very much in tune with redeeming the earth, which she writes about in some, de in some detail, the notion that the earth is, is really significant and has a life and a vibrancy, which we need to regain. The Trinity, <clears throat> if we look at figure six, we will see two models well, we look at figure five is the Rublev model, which many of you are familiar with, the three figures round there. And then we see two models of the Trinity below, one with the Trinity sort of embracing the earth and the other one with it outside of it. But if we look at figure five, this is her model of the Trinity with the spirit glowing, um, the human being in the middle and the outside uh, being God, the creator, and so on. Um, so... The human figure could be the sun, but it could be us. So that, that particular one, which I think is down there, uh, with the human being, do you see that the, the fontanelle is open at the top into the divine? People often look at that and you are using it now as a mandala and imagining the top of the head opening into, into the divine there. It, if you turn over and we get to figure seven, you will see that now the world is the body of God. There's God's head at the top, there's all the seasons, and we see the earth, air, fire, and water in there, and the human being in the middle. So God is not remote from the earth, the world is the body of God, which links with all of the theology of Sally MacFaig, 
the notion of a distant God somehow or other reaching down, the Sistine Chapel ceiling has done us no, no favours, really, um, the, the, of, of the, the body. We're in the body of God. We are the body of God. And so is the natural world. We're all linked together. And that, of course, is where um, eco-theology is, is going. And we see these, this lovely desire in figure, uh, sorry, figure nine. Um, sorry, the, the figure that... Uh, the figure figuring's gone wrong here. Figure eight is the one with the human being. You see God's head and all the there. And figure nine is the one next door where you've got no head of God. But the notion that everything's contained in the cycle of the seasons and it's all contained together. So you've got a huge ecological model in figure nine. It, we keep swinging through the seasons and harvesting and so on. If we, if we look at figure eight, we see she was a wisdom theologian. She was fascinated by the virtues, as we saw in that play. And in the end, she gets almost to a female trinity. Now, those are three virtues circling. They are, interestingly, not faith, hope, and charity, which is what you might expect, but love, peace, and humility. Humility, of course, being humus. Humility is from the earth. And it seems to me that one of the things we need in our society, a great deal right now, is a right humility. I need go no further. Um, <coughs> so, <laughs> which links us with the earth, and so on. Uh, figure, uh, that's figure 10. Figure 11, we see she created figure 11 and 12. Figure 11 is a synagogue. She's the Jew, Jewish figure, and she contains all the patriarchs and prophets holding them safely together before she yields to figure 12, who is Ecclesia, who's holding all of them in herself. So she creates these female models of the Jewish tradition and the, um, the, the, the Ecclesia. The last thing I want to say that our world needs to learn from her, really, is the nature of the visionary experience. I have no doubt that if Hildegard and Julian of Norwich were alive today, they'd be locked up somewhere long-term on mounds of Haloperidol. Because anything transcendent in our culture has been pathologized. It's not, it's not considered salutogenic, which is salvational, but it's considered as pathological. Um, there are many visionaries out there today. Indeed, many of you may be sitting here right now. People are afraid to tell of the vision because of that it might mean pathologizing. We need to learn again, it seems in the church, what the medieval spiritual directors learned, that's the discernment of the spirits. Coming up to Halloween, aren't we? The discernment of the spirits, are they helpful or are they not? How do we embrace them? What do they tell us to do? Um, that's always what Hildegard says. She goes out and writes, I mean, she didn't, local clergy didn't like her much. It's not right that a clergy has a cloak and a coat when, they're, when the people haven't got either. Give one of them away and share them. Um, so the vision is given to fight for justice and so on. So what she tells us is redeem the visionary experience uh, because it can be coming from the divine. I'm just going to sing one song to finish. We are feathers, we are floating on the loving breath of God. We are floating on the loving breath of God. We are feathers, we are floating on the loving breath of God. We are floating on the loving breath of God. For women, it's an imp extremely important story, and we desperately need those role models. One of the other mystics I do is Hilda of Whitby. Uh, I'm sitting, sitting there with women religious in front of me. They say we know the story of St. Augustine and St. Benedict, but nobody tells us the story of Hilda, and she's one of our ancestors. And, and that has been the tragedy, I think, of it, really, of the, of, of the church in general, and trying to redeem that in some way. I think is part of it. It set off a whole, this is my book on the, and um, the, you'll see the Music, Spirituality and Wellbeing International um, website there. It led to a whole study of the spirituality of music um, and where it sits today, which includes In Tune with Heaven or Not, women in Christian liturgical traditions, but it also includes the spirituality of the djembe drum um, and the orishas 
and so on. And at present, I'm looking at one on the shamanic drum and all of those. So where does spirituality sit in music? And that was really colored by looking at Hildegard, looking at where that's gone now. And some people would say that music is now the main spirituality for people rather than the great faiths because the music asks you, doesn't ask you for a creed or a belief system, as um, James Atwell writes in the book that I know Alan has in front of us here, on the book on John Taverner, that music just pours God's unconditional grace on you, and it doesn't ask you whether you're worthy. Women still, particularly women who want to stay in relationship with the church, need to have those role models um, uh, put for, for them so that women have the courage of speaking out and bringing their experience into the church, the notion of birthing and incarnating, all of that. I mean, we're coming up to Advent, and you know, why isn't Advent about birthing? <laughs> That's what we're leading up to. But uh, <clears throat> it's another story. <laughs>John Taverner came upon Hildegard later in his life, as indeed I did. I mean, I ran the Hildegard Society, and when we started that in the 1980s, I think it was, she was very little known. Um, and gradually, she became better known, and now we know there are recordings of her music and so on. So she became, and of course, just to go back to your question, she, there was a move to make her, she, for most of my, my experience of her, she wasn't a saint. She was what's called a local saint. So she was not, blessed from the papacy, but she was saint in Germany, but nowhere else. So um, you will know that I think it's about 10 years ago now she was made a doctor of the church. So she needs, is it, but it's taken quite a long time, hasn't it, since 1098 or 1179. Um, <clears throat> there appear to have been a number of obstacles put in the way of her sanctification. So that notion of female saints and how difficult that is. But um, so John Taverner came across her. He too believed that his inspiration came directly from the divine. And he also believed um, in the healing power of music. The, uh, he, his most famous phrase, the reason that the book is called Heart's Ease, is that he says, if my, that's the, the basic intention of music is heart's ease. And, it sh and, and if my music can give one moment of heart sees, I will have done what I'm asked to do. Now, how far have we moved from that? I often suggest that if one went to the London Symphony Orchestra about to play in the festival hall and said, I want you to play this to love the audience, they might think you're from another planet. But that is, of course, the intention of music. And how far we've moved. We've celebrated, we've, we've put technique in, in place of intention. And of course, it's not by accident that Paul uses music as his example. You know, without love, a symbol clashed is simply a tinkling symbol. A symbol clashed in order to heal and to revive is different from a symbol simply clashed. That is what John believed, that there is that power in music and you use that power you, the first thing you must do is get your intention right. We've lost that in other areas, I think, when I watch some of the Orthodox priests preparing the service, and, um, you know, they take an hour to prepare the place with, you know, going around the place and so on. And I see sometimes pe people, you know, rushing in to do things. But that notion of the intention, I think, is important, and that's what Taverner shared with her. And the notion that it is divine, and you need that connection with the divine. And I would say now, call the divine what you will, um, and so on. Julian of, Julian of Norwich is a different ball game, I think. Um, Hildegard appears to have been a visionary from the age of three, um, and it often made her ill. And I've got no doubt that her bourgeois merchant parents were not entirely sorry to oblate <laughs> their child to God, <laughs> not knowing quite what to do with a visionary child. <laughs> Um, and so on. And of course, she didn't know what to do. She told the visions and people said, you know, keep quiet about them. Um, whereas Julian's appears to be a near-death experience. We know that at the point where she has the vision, she's on the point of death. The, 
the um, uh, priest has been called and the cross is held in front of her face. And it's when the cross is held in front of her that then she receives this long series of visions about the crucifixion um, and so on. So, um, it, and then she spends the rest of her life exploring, whereas for Hildegard, it appears to be in a continuous raft of, of visions happening all the time and often making her ill um, so, and so on. Um, she does describe them in, in some detail. Um, not sure that I can find it and whether there are any more questions. That, um, she's, she says that she doesn't, she's not unconscious. She's still conscious um, in receiving it, in receiving those visions and so on. So it's not in a sense like a near-death experience. Um, it's, and it's a regular part of her life um, and so on. Whereas Julian appears to be one off, she goes into the cell and she spends her time writing the, re the revelations of divine love and, and exploring what she means. Whereas Hildegard's are spread over three books of theology. They're integrated into the text. We have no drawings of, of Julian at all. Um, whereas Hildegard, we've got these, these drawings. What's interesting in there, she appears to have found a way of mixing silver into, without tarnishing. Unfortunately, the original set were sent away in the last war and have never returned. So we only have a very good, these very good copies. So we can't look at exactly how she put the silver in. So, and I think if we look at Hildegard, I imagine if we were close to her, and that's the way I sing her, she was a very ebullient character, you know, passionate. Whereas Julian describes herself as homely and courteous. I can't imagine Hildegard wanting to be lo locked in a cell in that way. She was going to and fro across the Rhine and preaching up and down and so on. Um, I've done an opera looking at the two of them, um, bringing the two together, and I think they're very interesting uh, contrasts of how the visionary plays out, but both accept it in their time, which they wouldn't be now, I don't think. I think one of the problems is the interpretation of the neumes, which are problematic. They are the neumes that are, we're familiar with in the medieval period, but for example, um, she uses some of the symbols in a different way. They don't work quite they, the way they do. So I think there's, if you hear various versions of the recordings, they come out differently because people interpret the neumes in different ways. So I think that's been a problem. Um, uh, I think it's a, an interesting ball game because it is monophony. You know, it's a single line of song, whereas a lot of the medieval stuff is sort of the three parts with, and so on and so forth, more harmonic. And I think as a culture, we're not used to monophony. Um, we're, ha you know, we'll hear plain song in church, but even that's accompanied quite often, yeah, and so on. So the notion of the single line of song, I think, has made it problematic. Um, also, I think the pitching of it so high, some of them, but then remember there was no standardization of pitch in those days, and you heard me sing very low. Um, I'm, I'm older now, I'm, you know, uh, and so, you know, the older Hildegard may well have sung low. Um, so I think there's been, a bit of discouragement when you get people like the 16 and that doing it all so beautifully that people think, oh, well, you know, I can't do that. So we won't, so people haven't been, hasn't been access to it in the way there has been to some of the other stuff. Um, I've, I've got a book, which again, my email address is there, which we transcribed 30 of them into, um, for onto, five onto five lines. So they're relatively, and I also translated the Latin in a way that it fits like the, the, uh, the English, fits like the Latin did. And that's another problem, the Latin and so on. Um, and I think she simply wasn't known, but I mean, you know, there are now prom concerts, you know, with, with it in, and the, that would have been unheard of 30 years ago. And when I first went to Germany and was transcribing it in a cafe in Bingen, and somebody said, what are you doing? And I said, it's Hildegard. And that for them, it was all healing, it was all medicine. The music was virtually unknown, as was the theology. It was simply because Hitler did actually um, uh, uh, authorize alternative practitioners. And Hildegard's medicine lived in that strand of, of, of medicine. Um, and for a long time, even now, the remedies are better known than the music is. 
So I think it's, 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 it's a very interesting question. I think it's partly to do with the single line of music um, and how, our, um, interestingly, I was approached to do a television programme on it, and we did do a little bit of it. And then the person said the music was too boring. <laughs> and that says it all. Too boring for a modern audience. Um, and we're unable, because we've got now so much rhythm, and we've got so much um, uh, harmony and melody, that we can no longer understand or appreciate you know, the subtleties of a, of a moving line in that way, um, and so on. I mean, the example I will give is a very different one, but I think we hear what we're used to hearing. Um, uh, and it's a, a, some leader of an African country who's taken to a program of Mozart in the Festival Hall, thanks the person that took, took him and says, but I thought your music was more complicated. And of course, he was used to hearing the complexity in the area of rhythm. But Mozart rhythmically is very simple, and all the complexity lies in the harmony and the melody, but he couldn't perceive that. And of course, we did the same when we went to Africa. We said their drumming was very simple, but we couldn't hear the subtleties of the rhythm. So, and I think there is a real problem with hearing the single line um, and the, the melodic, the interest in it, holding people's interest in a culture which is so used to rhythm and their, or, or melody and harmony. So I think we need to sing it in order to, in order to get people used to it.